Good evening, everyone. We continue our study in the book of Ezekiel. Today, we have a very long chapter, chapter 16, which we will break into two segments. But more importantly is it follows from chapter 15. The word again is the word and then. The theme for chapter 16 actually is built on chapter 15 that God says he's, he's had it with them, that he will throw the, 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 the vine tree into the fire, that he will set his face against Jerusalem. Now, all of this that we have discussed yeah. yesterday is now building into chapter 16. And, and God is now using this prophecy as a parable as an illustration to demonstrate to Jerusalem who they really are as seen from God's eyes. And that is important because in, in an Eastern Oriental culture, much is discussed from the viewpoint of the person who is speaking. And so in this case, the word of the Lord came to me and that is what is being said. It's very audible. And these are audible words as given to Ezekiel. It says, son of man or son of a man, Ben Adam. And this word is an imperative. But this word is translated quite well in the English. The word here is cause to know cause Jerusalem to know her abominations abominations would be things that is disgusting to God disgusting to God now it may not be disgusting to Jerusalem but really the the prophecy is really, giving a perspective from God's eyes. So good and evil is also from the eyes of the beholder. And in this prophecy, it is always to, to seen from God's eyes. So son of man, Ezekiel, caused Jerusalem to know what she has done that is really disgusting to God. And then say this, Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem. And so these will be words that is very specific, that is directed to Jerusalem. Both the northern and the southern land has been taken over, first by the Assyrians, now by the Babylonians, and what is left is only Jerusalem. And so the parable is being spoken through Ezekiel, very much like holding up a mirror to let her see how she has been and how God views her. So that's the perspective we are going to look at right now. He says, your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. Now, this whole passage is not really talking about all the way back to Abraham. This word your is the present day. Now, present day means present to the time of Ezekiel. And so God is looking at them saying that right now you are behaving as if you were originating from the land of Canaan. You are behaving as if you are born there. Right? Your, your dwelling place. Now, if you look at verse 3, it says your, your dwelling place and your birthplace. This is your birthplace. your origin. And so you get an A and a B. Basically, God is saying, 
you know what? Based on your present day character, your present day attitude, and whatever you've done, you know, it looked like you actually originated from the land of Canaan. Your father must be an Amorite and your mother a Hittite, both from Canaan. And they are the ones that doesn't seem to know God. As for your origin, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling cloths. No eye pitied you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you, but you were thrown into the open field when you yourself were loath on the day you were born. Now, this is really looking back at the Israelites. That they seem to be like a lost child. An unwanted child. Now, some of these words here may resonate with the fact that uh, they are found in a land that does not belong to them. Uh, like in Egypt, like they, they were there and there were like 600,000 men, a lot of them. But then they were like a nation that, that nobody wanted. Uh, so when you were born, your navel cord was not cut. You're still attached to your mother, a Hittite. All the foreign practices seems to be there. Uh, you, you were not washed in water. You were not cleansed. You were just left by yourself. No eye pitied you. The Egyptians didn't care. Neither would the Canaanites. Nobody cares. Nobody have compassion on you. And you were thrown into the open field. That would be the Goshen area. When you yourself were loath on the day you were born. So a lot of this is spoken in a parable that illustrates Israel as an unwanted child. Nobody wanted them wherever they were, whether in Egypt or whether they were in Canaan. Now, God is using this as a rebuke. So it is not really literally saying that, no, there was no Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob appears to have no relationship with the Israelites now because their behavior is as if they had a different parent. Verse 6, And when I passed by you and saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you in your blood, live. I made you thrive like a plant in the field. You grew, matured, and became very beautiful. Your breasts were formed, your hair grew, but you were naked and bare. And so this is an illustration that the child is viewed as a young woman, a young girl. This is a parable. So remember this, that while they were struggling in their own blood, they were struggling to survive. God says, yes, I want you to live. They were crying out to God in the book of Exodus. And God says, yes, I want you to live. And so I made you thrive like a plant in the field. What does that mean? Now, in verse 7, you find that this word literally means you were sprouting out sprouting out. Sprouting out in the open field. Not just like a plant. It doesn't say like a plant. It was sprouting out in the field. Very much like grass. You know when the grass grows, it grows everywhere. And so basically saying that well, the Israelites in Egypt suddenly grew to a very large number. 600,000 men came out of Egypt and that will make a population of at least one and a half to two million people, including women, children, and the elderly. 
and then animals along with it. And so they sprouted out everywhere in large numbers. And then you grew, you matured, and became very beautiful. Now, this is speaking like a girl. You, know? you grew up in your adolescence, and you're coming out to become a young woman very well in, in the uh, puberty age. Your breasts were formed. Your hair grew long. But you were actually naked and bare. Now, some people would say that this is very much the clothes of slaves. They were in Egypt. Many of them were working very hard. And they were not in their own home enjoying life. And so this is an important element basically to remind Jerusalem, whoever was left, who are unfaithful, and God is scolding her. When I passed you by again and looked upon you, indeed your time was the time of love. It was time to be married. And so God says, and this is an illustration again, God says, so I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you, you became mine, says the Lord God. Now, verse 8, the Lord God is Adonai Yehovah. Now, what does this mean? Very simply, if you have looked at the book of Ruth, spreading my wings. It literally means to spread my skirt, spread my garment, to cover, right? To, to cover. This is very symbolic in the Hebrew culture. It is the hem of the skirt. So wing is really the hem. So you can just imagine God lifting up the skirt or the garment and put it over Jerusalem over the Israelites figuratively figuratively and and to cover her nakedness to cover her shame and I swore an oath to you that I will take you out of Egypt by his strong and mighty arm and there was a covenant that he cut with Israel and you became mine. And so all of this you should read in Exodus chapter 19. This is a, an illustration of marriage. So to cover a person with your wings or the hem of your garment essentially is a symbol to say that this young woman is going to be under my tent. And this is how the ancient Hebrew people uh, offer to marry. Uh, and, and it's symbolic to, to show love. And this is a showing of love that the man will want to protect and to provide for the woman under his tent where he will become the head of the family and he will make sure that she is taken care of and protected and guarded and fed. And all of this is very much a symbol of marriage. Exodus 19 tells us that it is at that time at Sinai that God overshadowed them and cut covenant with them, which is a blood covenant from chapters 19 to 24, and something that you should go back and uh, revise and review as well. This is to show that God is looking back, looking at Israel, how it has all come about. Why is it that you still behave as if your, your, your parents are Canaanites, or Amorites, or Hittites. 
God has patience and compassion on her, now her, by way of referencing Israel, and God married Israel. Verse 9, and, and then I washed you in water. Yes, they crossed the Red Sea. I thoroughly washed off your blood, the blood that they were struggling with, the blood that they had used to smear on the doorpost, and basically is to cleanse. This, these are all cleansing. In water, and to wash off all the dirtiness. And I anointed you with oil. Now understand that these are all scented oil rubbed over, and I guess it would be similar to what we call perfume today. I clothe you in embroidered cloth. Now, these are all very uh, Hebrew. These are all embroidered garments. I gave you sandals of badger skin. Uh, the skin of a badger is very precious to be made into sandals. I clothe you with fine linen. And I covered you with silk. These are all descriptions of an expression of love. Remember, it is presenting Israel as a woman that God is marrying. I adorn you with ornaments. I put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. All these are adornments. Uh, for a woman, particularly uh, that, that's going uh, into a, a marriage. And this is how God expressed love to Israel. All of these is poetic, by the way. And I put a jewel on your nose. And this would be a nose ring. earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown, a tiara on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, your clothing was of fine silk and linen and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour, honey, and oil that is designed for those who can afford. And God gave them all. You were exceedingly beautiful. And God expressed how faithful Israel was to come to Sinai and succeeded to royalty, uh, that she is a royal priesthood. Your fame, your, your name, actually that would be a better way of saying, so your name went out among the nations because of your beauty. Everything that Israel did was something that was spectacular. For it was perfect through my splendor, which I had bestowed on you. So you can think of it as a love poetry. Describe, describing Israel. And it is important for us to realize Song of Solomon is also a, a more extended version of these words of love. Now, they are not typical of uh, modern day expression, but this is a Hebrew way of expressing. Up to verse 14, everything was good. Great marriage. God has given them a land flowing with milk and honey. They had everything to eat. Verse 15, and then, And then you put confidence. In your own beauty. Yes, you were adorned, but you thought that you were so beautiful because of yourself. And that was the wrong thing to trust. To trust in your own beauty. And now from verse 15, God is describing their journey after Solomon. 
at the time of Solomon, it was the height of the beauty of the land of Israel. David and Solomon provided Israel the golden years that nations all around fully respected Israel and, and saw how great Israel was and the grandeur of the temple of God that was inaugurated by Solomon. And then soon enough, you trusted on your own beauty. Again, this is all very poetic. Played the harlot because of your fame and poured out your harlotry on everyone passing who would have it. What does this mean? It means that Israel was willing to play the harlot. Now, play the harlot means a woman offering to other men. And that's harlotry. You actually, you have a man, but you actually go out and 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 have relations with other men. And so this idea of playing the harlot is often used in the Bible to describe how Israel went out to serve other gods. So you poured out your harlotry on everyone passing by, meaning all the nations that came by, you would serve their gods as well. You took some of your garments Adorn multicolored high places. These are Bama. Now understand that these are Bama where it they, they are altars used for idols. You use it for yourself and you play the harlot on them to serve other gods. Such things should not happen, nor should it be seen, or should should it come to pass. Because God had stated in Mount Sinai that you shall have no other gods before me. For I am a jealous God and that I will come and visit your third and fourth generation if that is what you do. And God is now putting this parable in a poetic way, what they have done all these years. You have also taken your beautiful jewelry from what God had given earlier, my gold and my silver, which I had given you, and made for yourself male images of idols and played the harlot with them. So understand, playing the harlot, right? Playing the harlot is to follow, serve other gods, other Elohim. You took your embroidered garments and covered them. Now, what does that mean? When you actually take garments and cover, you then get married to them. Although these are all symbolic, it is what God has said, I have put my wings of my garment over you. I have married you. But then you took your embroidered garments and then covered over these idols and then you got married to them so how many lords are there in your life and you set my oil my incense before them so for whatever they were using in Shiloh in the temple and then after the Solomon period they did what they used to do to Jehovah, to other idols. My food, which I gave you, the pastry of fine flour, oil, and honey, which I fed you, you set it before them as sweet incense. And that was what happened. And so God is seeing all this and he's putting all these complaints in this particular uh prophecy. What else did God complain? Moreover, you took your sons and your daughters whom you bore to me. Who are they? They are the firstborn. They are the ones who are to be dedicated to serve God. 
and then you sacrifice them to be devoured. Now in verse 20, you need to understand that this is a, a, a way of presenting the children to kill them and offer them to gods like Molech. You sacrifice them to be eaten, slaughtered, and eaten. Now, we don't read much of this in the Bible, but oftentimes it will pop up here and there. But here God is listing out the problems he see with Israel. After the golden era, everything went downhill. You offered to Molech your children. That is what God doesn't want. God doesn't want anyone to offer their children. Now, why do idolatry require children? Because they are seen to be virtuous, innocent, pure. God doesn't want any of this because when God says, your sons and daughters whom you bore to me, right here, really means that when they grow up, they are to serve me, not to be killed and burned and to be eaten. And that would be cannibalism. Were your acts of harlotry a small matter? Rhetorical, isn't it? Rhetorical. What do you think the answer is? The answer is absolutely not. They are not a small matter. If it was a small matter, God would not have made mention. But because it is such a serious case, why? I think that you need to understand when God says, you have slain my children, offered them up by causing them to pass through the fire and they were all burned. They did not respect the sanctity of life. Now, the sanctity of life is a very big topic in God's themes because God made mankind in his image according to his likeness. And mankind is unique above all animals. And mankind is the only one who can interact with God. And when you take a life that God had made and sacrifice the children and kill them and eat them and offer them in the fire to the gods, they are abominations to God. And in all your abominations and acts of harlotry, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare, struggling in your blood. In all the old days before they became a nation, they were nothing. They were struggling. They were calling out to God. But now they are no longer thinking of that. So remember, did not remember is a very interesting passage. For example, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Why is remembering in the days of your youth important? Because that was where you came from. You were in a less fortunate position. Now that you are in a better position, you think you can do everything by yourself. And you have forgotten that it was God who did it all for you. And that is the whole poetry here. God is holding them responsible for them not remembering what God had done. Verse 23. Then or and then. It was so after all your wickedness. Now, every time you see this word, please go back and check the original. This is your evil. Your evil or your evil uh, that you have done. And then God says in verse 23, Hoi. Hoi is like a very disappointed sigh, says the Lord God. 
Adonai Yehovah. You also built for yourself a shrine. And what do you mean a shrine? You actually built, well, in this case, uh, a, a prominent place. I think in the modern day, a shrine, right? This is a prominent place. The word itself talks about uh, a hole in the wall. And the hole in the wall is a concave. And then inside, they would have made, uh, I guess they would have made idols, right? An image that they will put in there. These are what we call, well, in modern days, it's called shrines. Uh, in the Hebrew word, it's gave. And they are small places, right? Small places. So you have made yourself a shrine, a concave hole. And you have made high places for yourself in every street. Now, this idea of high places would be little altars. The altars are typically squarish, raised up, and then at the corner of every uh, edge, right, you can see that it is made of horns and these are what we call the altars the bama small ones at the at the at every street you built your bama at the head of every road and made your beauty to be at hoard abhorred you offered yourself to everyone who passed by and multiplied your acts of harlotry to many gods. Many gods. You also committed harlotry with the Egyptians, your very fleshly neighbors. Now, verse 26 talks about fleshly neighbors. Uh, it is about the, the flesh, of growing flesh. What that would refer to is it's the form of, um, uh, I guess in a poetic way, a form of lust, right? In a poetic way, uh, a form of lust. You lusted over your neighbor's gods and increased your acts of harlotry to provoke me to anger. And whatever they did, God, and by God it would be Jehovah, became more incensed. That, that would be how it's read. Now let's do a few more verses so that we will make a logical end today. Verse 27. 27 is like a little temporary conclusion. It says, Behold, look, I have stretched out my hand against you. Now, every time you see hand stretched out, it is about to hit someone. To hit someone. So, I have tried to teach you and discipline you. So it's a very visual expression here. I've stretched out my hand against you. I want to slap you. I have diminished your allotment. Now understand, allotment is portion. And portion here would mean the land. 
I have clipped your land. What does that mean? Well, the land has a, 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 a territory that God has given. And as they, they serve other gods, as they serve other gods, God says, he allowed the enemies. I gave you up to the will of those who hate you, the daughters of the Philistines, who are ashamed of your lewd behavior. So the Philistines, during the time of the judges, during uh, the, 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 the time of the kings, they were continuously a problem. You also played harlot with the Assyrians. You thought the Assyrians would be friends, but they're not, because you were insatiable. Indeed, you played the harlot with them and were still not satisfied. You had cooperation with the foreign enemies. Moreover, you multiplied your acts of harlotry as far as the land of the trader called Dea. That would be the Babylonians. And even then, you were not satisfied. Now, all of this is that is talking about Israel reaching down to Egypt and adopting her gods, and then the Philistines. And then the Assyrians, and then the Babylonians. Now understand that there are many more nations, but these were the ones that God had, had brought out to us in this particular complaint. The Egyptians, the Philistines, the Syrians, uh, the Chaldeans. And these were enemies. They became friends and they became enemies. Israel just didn't know how to behave herself. Uh, playing harlotry with the Assyrians means to go after the Assyrian gods. But then going after the Babylonian gods. Going after the Egyptian gods. And so what you see is what we probably have been able to discover in the archaeology in Israel today. That... The land of Israel, every little corner you dig, you find little statuettes of idols. Israel was a monotheistic nation. As we have seen, God married her, gave her all the beauty and blessings, but she thought she could do it herself. And she went out after other gods. And that was that is what this chapter up to verse 29 is saying. That they went after other gods besides Jehovah. And so archaeology have shown that there are little statuettes all over the place. And many people are surprised. But when we read something like this in chapter 16... It should not be a surprise because God has made it into a major complaint against Jerusalem that these people have been doing this ever since past the Solomon era. And the complaint that God has is this. Verse 30. Verse 30 is a very interesting expression. How degenerate is your heart? The idea of degenerate. Uh, you can say that it is weak. It is I guess you can say how far down it has dropped. 
it is to drop, to be weak, to droop. This is the picture you get, that it is not healthy, it is drooping and is falling to the ground. How degenerate is your heart? The idea of uh, your heart would be very much their choices, right? Their choices, their decisions, what they want to do. And so God will judge them on what they do, says Adonai Yehovah. Now, this word says is not your regular word. This word is Naum. Naum is, we should say that this would be a declaration or declares God. It is something more serious than just say something. And then God says, when you do all these things, verse 30, when you, when you do all these things, seeing you do all these things, or when you do all these things, this is not seeing as in the eye seeing. So when you do all these things, this is actually the deeds of a brazen harlot. Now, what does this mean? First of all, brazen would be imperious. Uh, someone who is dominated by passion. A compulsive woman who just wants to go do it. And so God says, I can see that all your choices, what you want to do, has gone to such a, a low esteem when I can see whatever you do is, is abhorring. God cannot believe what he is seeing in the Israelites. Now, that is up to verse 30. This is really telling a historical background of how they have degenerated up to this point in time. All right. And we will then continue the next portion tomorrow. Uh, so that we can wrap up chapter 16. And with this, we come to the end of our session today.